Welcome to this discourse. Uh, our discourse is called Social Theory and the Fundamental Challenges to Humanity. Um, and we have with us an august group of scholars of uh, Dr. Rudolf Siebert, Syed Javid Miri, Michael Naughton, Mehdi Shariati, uh, all to discuss the problems, the many problems and challenges that are facing humanity today. Um, I'm going to give my um, very broad look uh, analysis of some of the things that I think are pertinent issues that we're dealing with today. And then uh, I'll hand it over to uh, scholars who, much, who are much more smarter than I am. So from my perspective, we're, we're plagued today uh, with two kinds of challenges, the global challenges and, and regional challenges. And the regional challenges seem to dominate right now the, the life world as well as the media. Um, giving us this almost like psychological reprieve from dealing with these really large global systemic challenges that we have to deal with. Uh, a reprieve that's not necessarily a good thing, but nevertheless, it seems to be our reality at the moment. Um, some of the things that I, that I see are going on um, that are among the regional challenges are, for instance, Russia's war in Ukraine. Uh, which has been, uh, at least here in the U.S., has been um, an issue that we've all been dealing with, thinking about, even though it comes up very sparingly now in the mainstream media. Uh, if you're looking at social media, it's, it's all over the place, and good analyses are being done, really bad analyses are being done. Um, but from the perspective of more left-wing social theory, it's very clear that the international left has been uh, divided on this issue. Uh, and two coalitions have emerged on this issue of the war in Ukraine. Uh, there's been the liberal left or liberal socialist coalition, which is overwhelmingly supporting Ukraine and its defense uh, against uh, the Russia's war of aggression. And then there's been what's being called now internationally the, the red-brown coalition, and that's a coalition of, of old school communists, old school leftists, and fascists. So the fascists in, in <laughs> Europe, by and large, have been supporting the war in Ukraine. Uh, fascists here in the US have been supporting the war, uh, supporting Russia in the war in Ukraine. So the left has been divided on this issue, um, which has basically, and in many ways, effectively made it. Um, you know, ineffectual to deal with anything else because they're not talking to each other at all, um, which is unfortunate, but it, this this war has done that, um, which is very interesting because this is a change from what we had in World War II where there was a liberal communist coalition uh, against fascism in World War II, and now you have a fascist communist anti-liberal coalition uh, today. So it's a massive change, but uh, it's one that I think is is uh, not suitable in a good way, but but one that corresponds to the changing ideologies in in this post supposedly post ideological world that we're clearly not in. Um, you know, it, it's also an issue of of I think um, perceptions have changed massively in this war because of this war. I think there was this understanding that Russia, of course, was the second army, as it was called. Um, and therefore, the you know the first army, the first military is the the West, you know NATO, the United States, and the second one was Russia, and that that clearly has dissipated. Um, the great Russian bear that people thought they were dealing with is is not the great Russian bear at all. Um, it's not the second best army in the world. It seems to be the second best military in Ukraine. Um, it's already a failed war. Um, the Russian recent Russian papers that were were leaked by the British uh, showed that the Russian plan was to take Kiev in three days. Of course, that didn't happen. They were to take the entire country in ten days. Of course, that didn't happen. And they were to annex the entire country by August. And of course, that didn't happen. Uh, so increasingly now, it's turned into a total krieg against the the people of Ukraine, predominantly. Uh, civilians being targeted, uh, unfortunately. So, but this this war has led to an increased militarization of of the West, where now the the NATO countries are increasing their militarization because they want to send a message to 
to Russia that um, you know that, that they're not going to sit back and allow this to happen and let Russia to change the uh, geography and the landscape of of Europe. And so they're uh, militarizing, of course. Lots of money is being spent on that, and a lot of people are making money on that, unfortunately. But that's the way it is. Um, you also have now, of course, the the, the protest movements in in Iran. Uh, that are very uh, disconcerting as to what's going to happen there. Um, you know, th th that has spilled over to the suppression of the Kurds in Iran and attacks on the Kurds in, in Iraq. Um, and the last thing you need is more uh, destabilization in, in that part of the world. There's the constant Chinese threat to Taiwan. Um, and for some reason, the U.S. government, um, I don't know why, ill-conceived constant you know, uh, poking at the Chinese when it comes to Taiwan. Um, the cultural cleansing of the Turkic Muslims uh, by Han Chinese in China's West now in, in, in Japan, I'm reading now this past week, is beefing up its military capabilities due to the threat, uh, the perceived th uh, threat from China and Russia. Uh, there's now just this week again uprising tensions and violence at the Indian and Chinese borders where they've been getting into a fights and apparently I didn't know this before but um, any type of military equipment is not allowed around this border and so it's hand to hand combat that the Chinese and the Indians are getting involved in uh, on their border. Uh, the ongoing immigration crisis in, in Europe, even though that has uh, abated a bit, it's still always under the surface and any little thing can bring it back up. Um, the deep split here in the U.S. Uh, in the American citizenry, I mean, 74 million people voted again for, for Trump, um, probably the most psychologically unfit human being to ever sit in that office. <laughs> Um, just a, a psychological Frankenstein. My my book on uh, Trump's political psychology should be coming out soon. It's it's it's. Um, I've never been more frightened of a single human being in my life. Um, a recent coup d'état attempt in in Peru in corporate neoliberalism of, um, of the world, which which continues to grow and it breeds contempt for democracy. Um, and democracy seems unable to stem the the systematic problems that come out of neoliberalism and thus causes people or sets the foundwork or the, the, the framework or the groundwork uh, for people's desire for these authoritarian type leaders that can end the chaos, um, whether that be the, you know, the, the chaos in the jobs or the economics or the cultural chaos or whatever it is, there, there's a yearning there for some kind of strong uh, leader, some kind of strong man, in much of the same way that Plato in the Republic said that democracy would collapse into tyranny. You, you see that very, um, that very uh, uh, dynamic happening. But those are the the episodic, the regional problems that I see that are dominating uh, the media. They're dominating our lives in many ways. And like I said before, these kind of can, they're like a temporary reprieve and not in a good way from the much more bigger global systemic problems. Um, you know, and, and it makes me think already of, of these activists and I'm sure you've all seen them who are going into, um, going into art museums and they're throwing things like tomato soup uh, at priceless works of art, you know, Van Gogh's and things like that. Um, and, and, and of course, this is something I, I, I'm appalled by immediately. I think that's the whole point of it is to make you appalled and uh, by the whole thing that they're doing. But, you know, we have to, and so I condemn it, but we have to look at what is their, what is their point? And their point seems to be that they're making these drastic measures, these, these beyond headline getting measures because you know, throwing tomato soup at Van Gogh is is unbelievably appalling. But the point there is, is to say something like, you know, we're consumed by these regional challenges and the global challenges, the real threats to humanity are going, not unarticulated because we articulate them all the time, but they're going <laughs> unchallenged. They're, they're, there's nothing's really going to happen about these things, right? Um, because we're focusing on the war in in uh, in Ukraine, or because we're focusing on the protests in Iran, or we're fo pro focusing on what's going on in China, that we're no longer talking about things like global climate change. 
um, in the, the the next pandemic that is sure to come, right? As global climate change gets worse, um, and the you know, of course, global climate change causes uh, famine and flooding and cross uh, crop loss, which causes resource wars. I mean, that seems to me what's on the horizon is these growing resource wars that that is not just going to be about oil, but water might be uh, the next what the next war is about. Um, you know, such of these these larger problems, these global catastrophes, especially dealing with global climate change, causes um, you know increased amounts of mass movements of people of refugees, and we've seen this just in the last ten years from war, from other kinds of wars, at least it's twenty years. Uh, the mass refugee issues from Syria and Afghanistan and Iraq and, and now Ukraine, seven million refugees in. Uh, in Europe, and even here, and I'm in the middle of nowhere in Michigan, and we're we're taking in a lot of Ukrainian refugees around around this area. Um, you know, and and especially in Europe, less so in the United States, but th these refugees oftentimes can cause greater angst and alienation among the population that are taking them in. Um, you know, where it looks like all the resources and the time and the energy is going to take care of the refugees, you know, and not the native people, if you will. Um, you know, it, it might not necessarily be true, but that's the perception. And then, of course, that's um, there's a lot of politicians that take uh, advantage of that perception for their own personal gain. And we certainly had that here with with Donald Trump. And you see that happened in, in Italy just recently with the election of Maloney. Uh, with this kind of far right coalition that uh, has now is now in power, but on top of that, you have demographic collapse. I mean, we used to worry about how populations were going to get too big, and now we're talking about demographic collapse in parts of uh, in parts of the world, especially the industrialized world. And in if you're going to have a robust social system, as you would have, let's say in in Germany, you're going to need a, a lot of what. The UN, the UN itself calls replacement population. Um, you know, if you have a population that's getting older and, you know, they they're have all these social benefits, you need more and more workers. And but yet the population is getting smaller and smaller and less workers. So you're bringing in more replacement population, more immigration, more refugees. And of course, that feeds into that far right narrative of the replacement uh, theory, the great replacement theory that that white people, that European people are being replaced by people of color in their own homes, in their own countries, in their own territories, right? And this is that fear of, of sameness, that somehow globalization and the mixing of all the populations are producing a, a single monoculture, which is what in German they call Volkerkaus, right? The, the chaos of the, the many peoples all into one um, into one country. And on top of that, what, what I've been seeing a lot more of uh, is within the West is this, this clash between um, oikophobia, as it's called, and, and xenophobia. Like, oikophobia is this uh, hatred for everything that is home, right? The oikos in, in Greek is home. So it, it's not necessarily the home that you're living in, but everything that's of your home culture. Uh, so it's pathological hatred for the self. Uh, and in the West, this is pretty much um, suffered by those on the left that look at Western history, European history, and say, yes, it's full of colonialism, imperialism, and a whole lot of horrible things. There's no doubt about that. We shouldn't deny that. But then it somehow becomes anything that any Western country does is automatically bad, right? So it, it is automatically condemnable because of the background, because of the history. And it breeds this self-contempt that doesn't allow for any type of real dialectical analysis of things. It's just black and white. West, the West, bad. Everyone else, good. As if everyone else never has nefarious motivations for doing anything else, right? Uh, so this is the oikophobia. And on the other hand, xenophobia, which is coming from... Uh, more and more the political right throughout the West with the hatred of everyone else, right? The What they call it, Western chauvinism. That somehow the West is best and everyone else is just kind of inferior. Now that's very old. And, you know, when there's all kinds of iterations of that over the course of the last couple hundred years or more, right? Um, and so, but this tribalism that comes out of it is something that I think is increasingly determining how 
politics is being done in different countries. Uh, and the last thing I would say globally is that if if this war, which I don't think there's a whole lot of, I think the possibility is low, but if the war in Ukraine does extend into eventually into NATO countries, uh, this very well could be a, a world war. Um, just for the simple fact that if that does happen, the Russian Federation, NATO countries, of course, will all go to every single country on the planet and say, who are you with? You're with us or you're against us. It's that same type of um, uh, same type of mentality that will bring the whole rest of the world into it. And people, are, I mean, countries are going to try to stay neutral, but we know how well that happens. It, it, it Eventually, somehow they'll have to take sides. So to me, those are the regional and then the, the global challenges that we're dealing with right now, some of the most important ones. And where does political and social philosophy fit into all this and social theory? Um, I think, you know, first and foremost, one of the things that we have to do is we have to clarify the problems, right? What are the ultimate problems? What's behind the problems? What are the motivations for the problems? What is the, the context, pretext, and the subtext? to all these problems. So we have a more comprehensive understanding of that. And that's our role as intellectuals, as scholars, I think, um, to clarify the problems, to clarify the terms, to clarify the values that are behind a lot of these problems. Also to engage in ideology critique, but not the cheap ideology critique of everyone who disagrees with me is simply ideological, but to understand and, and to really uh, uncover, unveil, right, and reveal the reasons why people are doing what they do, right? Um, because it's too easy to hide behind these altruistic, uh, high idea, high value principles for what we're doing and what other people are doing. Um, we have to get behind that. Also, as theoreticians, I think we have to follow what, what's called here by the American Psychological Association, the Tarasov doctrine or the Tarasov rule. And that is the, the duty to warn. Um, this came up again with Donald Trump that they're, you know, that psychologists, psychiatrists, mental health experts um, were basically muzzled here by the Goldwater rule. Basically, it was this idea that if Donald Trump is not your analyst and if he is not your patient and he has not given you permission to do so, you cannot talk about his mental state. Right? You have to remain silent about that. And that conflicts with the ethics of psychology and psychologists and critical um, psychoanalysts uh, with the Tarasov doctrine or the duty to warn that if we are um, the people who have the capabilities, the training, the education to warn about what we're seeing, the danger right in front of people, then we have the ethical duty to do that, right? Uh, and that's me something that I think we all have to be we all have to think about doing on top of that last point just being present being public teaching and engaging in that political discourse if we're not engaged of course in politics in and of itself we can at least be engaged in meta politics um, politics about politics politics outside of politics that affect politics um, and therefore we can hopefully bring in about a more rational uh, society, a more reasonable society that respects differences, but yet also understands the universality of humanity. So with that, I will take my bow and turn my microphone off so you no longer have to listen to my screaming two-year-old. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dustin. Thank you very much. Now the floor is yours, Professor Rudolf Siebert. 15 oh. minutes. If we can keep in 15 minutes, then we may have some time for the discussion as well. Oh, okay. The floor is yours, Professor <clears throat> the, Rudolf Siebert. Maybe Dustin can tell me when my time is up. Dustin, okay? Yes, I can do that. Yep. Okay. Um, I just want to contribute a few uh, thoughts, which I worked through recently. Um, it is the beginning of a book which is concerned with psychological elements in religion and religious moments in psychology, the origin and the dialectic of the authoritarian and the democratic characters and movements. So I just want to pick out one element in all this what Dustin has described and that is 
the appearance of the author or reappearance of the authoritarian or the fascist uh, personality. That is biographical to some extent because uh, in my youth, I uh, grew up in Nazi Germany. And so I have been very familiar with the uh, authoritarian personality. And of course, now this personality is returning. Sometimes when you have many years behind you, you have uh, the same experience first as a tragedy and later on as a comedy. And, but that is my fault that I stayed around too long. Uh, the, as far as the um, social sciences are concerned, I um, uh, go into German idealism, then in historical materialism and psychoanalysis as the theories uh, with which I approach this challenge of the authoritarian personality. The, um, our humanistic study as pan-entheistic discourse uh, describes the dialectic of the revolutionary inclusive democratic character and the counter-revolutionary exclusive authoritarian personality in the context of the historical journey of the exodus and redditus of the one into all and from all into one to be sure anti-authoritarian democracy, including egalité, fraternité, liberté, all translated from Christianity or other world religions into the modern enlightenment, is not bakuninist or anarchist or without <coughs> genuine democratic authority as the defeat of the recent authoritarian putsch in the United States and in Germany have shown only too clearly against the background of the only two real present existential threat against European and American democracies by ultra conservative followers of, let's say, Tsar Nicholas VI, or like it was in Germany recently, König Heinrich the Thirteenth, or fascist groups and movements. The central interest of our discourse is in the religious motivations, prejudices, representations, ideas, and so on, the, uh, the um, stories, narratives, and values, as well as in pathologies and criminality connected with the authoritarian personality and the democratic character in family, civil society, state, history, and culture, including art, religion, and philosophy, theology, and science. One psychological as well as sociological, philosophical and theological study travels, our psychological and so on, travels the via positiva toward the cataphatic God or the God of light, being, life, creation, as well as the via negativa toward an apophatic God the unnameable, unimaginable, hidden dark God of nothingness and of becoming the totally other, the God beyond the God who went under in the despair of men, women, and children in the world historical process. <clears throat> Shortly, our study travels towards the theodicy as the origin of theology, as the defense of God's goodness and justice in the face of the horror and terror of nature and human and the human world, and as concern with man's freedom and with the origin of evil as the extreme of finitude. This, our panentheistic discourse, will take place in the broader framework of the th critical theory of society, of the Frankfurt uh, and the New York Institute for Social Research a Jewish businessman Weil and a scholar Horkheimer had founded the Institute on the campus of the Johann Wolfgang von Goethe University, a new mainly business school after World War I in defense against the rising nationalism and racism, particularly anti-Semitism on the basis of German idealism 
Kant and Hegel, as well as Marx and Freud, it carried out this defense of democracy through psychology and sociology, through the psychoanalysis and historical ma material analysis of the authoritarian personality, family, state, and so on. Um, I grew up only 10 minutes walk from the Institute for Social Research, the Cafe Marx, on the west side, the working class section of Frankfurt. While the city was main, uh, was main divided into uh, business, it also produced, was, uh, while the city was mainly devoted to business and banking section of Frankfurt, the western section of Frankfurt, while the city was ma mainly devoted to business it also produced great thinkers like Goethe and Schopenhauer. Adorno and Fromm had grown up a generation earlier on the rich east side of the city. The Institute for Social Research with the critical theory of society was philosophically and theologically traveling the Via Negativa toward an apophatic God, the unnameable, unimaginable, hidden dark art, the totally other, and of the dialectical uh, religiology uh, or critical theory of religion and society derived from the former and traveling the via positiva toward the cataphatic God or the God of light, as well as the via negativa toward an apophatic God, the unnameable and hidden God. <clears throat> Our book traces the history of the dialectical encounter between the authoritarian personality on one side and the democratic character on the other. In the context of the original traditional unity between the religious and the secular, their modern antithesis and their possible postmodern reunion, as well as in the context of the original traditional unity between the individual and the collective, their modern division, separation, and antagonism, and their possible future new reunion. On November 15, 22, the Roman Catholic Church celebrated worldwide the life of St. Albert, the great authoritarian Franciscan media noted that Albert was a um, 13th century German Dominican who decisively influenced the church's stance toward Aristotelian philosophy brought to Europe by the spread of Islam, particularly by Averroes. In 2022, an information flood faced Christians and other believers in all branches of learning. One needed only to read current Catholic periodicals to experience the varied reactions to the findings of the natural and the social sciences. For instance, in regard to Christian or other religious institutions, lifestyles, and theologies. In canonizing Albert the Great, the church, which has had a long authoritarian history, belong, uh, seemed to point to Albert almost democratic openness to truth wherever it may be found as his claim to holiness. His character, characteristic curiosity prompted Albert to mine deeply for wisdom within an Aristotelian philosophy, which his church warmed to only with great difficulty after a long platonic past. Aristotle inspired Albert to explore the natural sciences and technologies of his time. He produced not only a blooming winter garden, but also a human walking and talking robot doll. His student Thomas Aquinas thought this robot to be from the devil, and he screamed at it and kicked against it full of fear and anxiety. Thomas was also an Aristotelian, like his teacher, and therefore was condemned by the church three times before he was canonized. The same happened to Thomas, likewise Aristotelian student, Meister Eckhart, who was condemned twice by the church and still awaits his justification and canonization 800 years later in 2022. I became familiar with Albert the Great during my youth in authoritarian fascist Germany, 
when my pastor Rodolfi built the St. Albert Church at the uh, Dornbusch in Frankfurt shortly after Albert's uh, canonization. After the Second Vatican Council, the church has once more a hard time to warm up to now post-Platonic and post-Aristotelian and post-Domistic dialectical philosophies and psychologies as that of Kant, Fichte, Schelling and Hegel, or with, uh, well, as Marx and Freud, Harkhammer, Adorno, Fromm, Marcuse, Lacan, Chichek, Milbank, and so on and so on, without whom the new rise of the authoritarian personality and the new threat to democracy inside and outside of the church in the European American and Slavic world cannot be understood and cannot be effectively resisted. On November 16, 17, 18, 2022, the Pope Francis received all German bishops in Rome in order to discuss with them the very prophetic and democratic German synodal way or synodal path which has radical proposals concerning homosexuality, women ordination to the deaconate and the priesthood, married and unmarried priesthood, and so on, which can be carried out only in a post-Platonic, close post-Aristotelian and post-Thomistic church, open for a highly dialectical philosophy, theology, psychology, and sociology. The Pope made clear that he did not want another Protestant church, but the Pope belongs to the Jesuit order, which carried the 500 years of counter-reformation and counter-revolution. If a new Protestant church appears in Germany in 2023, then this happens because the church responded to the first German reformation with more authoritarian counter-reformation, counter-revolution than with democratic reformation and revolution. Believers followed more the confession of their authoritarian kings, cultus regio, cuius religio, than their own conscience. The originally Greek and Christian principle of free subjectivity or subjective freedom, the very source of democracy, spread only slowly against the traditional principle of free objectivity or objective freedom into family with romantic love and state with democracy and church with Thomas Aquinas' emphasis on personal rationality, freedom, and conscience. People would be judged on Judgment Day in terms of their conscience and not in terms of the teachings of the church. Neither in Athens, nor in Jerusalem, nor in Rome, nor in Paris did the new principle of free subjectivity or subjective freedom, the Protestant principle, assert itself against the traditional principle of free objectivity or objective freedom, the Catholic principle, without crisis and some destruction. When in 2022, the leader of the German church and synod, Cardinal Marx and of Munich, offered the Pope his resignation, Pope Francis rejected it. That shows that the Pope is somewhat open for the prophetic German synodal way, in spite of the fact that it is no longer only monarchical or oligarchical, but rather democratic, and in spite of strong resistance from authoritarian American bishops and from the powerfully and globally spread likewise authoritarian Catholic, Catholic Eternal Word television network, which is closely connected with the right-wing Fox News particularly throughout the, through the artist Raymond Arroyo, a fanatic anti-socialist and anti-communist who is contributed to both networks. Nothing less than such papal openness will prevent a new schism in the German and European and American church. It was my former authoritarian and fascist doctor father, the Catholic church historian, Joseph Lords who discovered and admitted in his famous Luther book that the first German Reformation was not produced by democratic reformers like Wycliffe, Huss, Luther, Swingley, Münzer, or Calvin, but rather by the abominable conditions of the Western Catholic Church in the late Middle Ages. When Pope John Paul II came to Mainz, where Lords had taught up to the end of his life, 
He rejected Lawson's Luther study and demanded that it was to be redone. Lawson had been, as Luther specialist, a member of the Una Sancta movement, the purpose of which was the reunion of the Roman Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church. This study supports the German synodal path fully and completely, which is the result not only of the Catholic and Protestant Erasmian humanist theologians of the 16th century, Bishop Helding and so on, about whom I completed my dissertation, not under Lotz, but under another professor in Mainz, uh, the Catholic Church historian Anton Brück, who had no Nazi past and in the spirit of the more recent, more democratic Una Sancta movement. On really? December 13, 2022, the authoritarian Catholic St. Peter Basilica uh, news, uh, the um, authoritarian Catholic news agency noted that Pope Francis celebrated mass in Spanish in St. Peter's Basilica, December 12, 2022, to mark the feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, patroness of the Americas and the unborn. In this homily, the Pope explained that just as the Virgin Mary was present in the indigenous people of Mexico nearly 500 years ago, she was with us today. Francis said, today as yesterday, our Lady of Guadalupe wants to meet us too, as, the, as she did one day with Juan Diego on the hill of Tepeyac. She wants to stay with us. She begs us to allow her to be our mother, to open our lives to her son, Jesus, and to welcome his message so as to learn to love like him. According to Catholic tradition, yes. Uh, one more minute. Okay. According to Catholic tradition, the Virgin of Guadalupe appeared to San Juan Diego on the hill of Tepeyas in Mexico City in 1531 during a time of conflict between the Spanish and the indigenous people. Pope Francis said the Virgin Mary came to accompany the American people on this hard road of poverty, exploitation, socioeconomic and cultural colonialism. She is in the midst of the caravans that are walking northward in search of freedom. She is in the midst of the American people whose identity is threatened by a savage and exploitative paganism, wounded by the active preaching of a practical and pragmatic atheism, and she is there, I am your mother, she tells us. Pope Francis described quite adequately the exclusive authoritarian past and present in which our study of the struggle between authoritarianism and democracy is situated, what Hegel called the spirit of the times. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much. Thank you. That was very interesting. interesting. Very interesting. So, who wants to go next? Say Javed or Michael? Thank you very much, Professor. Well, now the floor is for uh, Michael Norton. Michael Norton, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'm just thinking, reflecting upon upon what both um, um, Justin and Rudy were saying. Um, it's, it's funny when you come and you have these kind of talks together, sometimes you get distracted by what you're saying and it kind of starts to infect, infect my thoughts as well. When you're thinking about um, social theory and the, 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 the fundamental challenges of humanity, I think that... <clears throat> I, I, I think that I have to confess that um, I've never actually looked up the definition of the word humanity until today. And I think that because of, because of my Catholic upbringing, I had an idea about humanity without actually going to look at what the word actually meant or the different meanings of the word humanity. 
So I've always kind of understood humanity in the sense of human kindness, about love for each other, about, about you know, things like that. And then when you look at the, the meaning of the word and the synonyms of that word, it just, it just can refer to a collective of human beings or mankind or society even. It's, it's got no necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to have any connotations about human kindness or being nice to each other. It's just a way that we describe homo sapiens. And that's another term that can be, can be um, that you can interchange with the word humanity. Because when you look at the different meanings, it just says homo sapiens is another word you could use as a, as a synonym for, for, for that term. And I think that when you're thinking about um, social theory, not even critical social theory. I mean, we've spoken before and about how social theories can help us to explain and to understand the world. And, you know, we, we know that many of us still think there's some value in, in, in Marx, in Marxian ideas. Um, but the, but the way in which, in which Marxism or Marxian ideas are, are received, certainly within the UK, is, you know, they've got no value to us anymore. People don't see themselves as proletariat in the way that these categories were used uh, in Marxism. And I was watching a, a video the other day of uh, Mark Hughes, and he was talking about how the Frankfurt School was principally about saying, we don't need to reify these concepts, but we need to kind of like reconstruct these kind of concepts for how they, how they have relevance in today's world. So, you know, we may not have, you know, millions of people working in cotton mills or down mines in Britain anymore, but we certainly have a proletariat or a kind of, a mass of, of, of work workers or wage slaves that if they're not in work, they don't have a life, but they don't see themselves as proletariat in the same way. And so when you speak in that language, people don't recognize themselves as being like that. And it's only recently, you know, that I've started to, to, to think about, you know, Foucault's another favorite of mine to teachers about how even our, like it's a social psychology to Foucault for me, it teaches us how even our very thoughts we think are so personal, they're not personal at all. They're a product of the discourses that have shaped the way that we think and act. So we know that using social theory, we can start to understand, you know, how the world is, but also, how, why we are the way that we are. And I'm thinking that, you know, it's only recently I got, I wrote something about Freud and now I'm reading quite a bit about Carl Jung and I'm thinking about not just describing the way the world is, but trying to understand why is it so difficult to actually try to change the world, to try to make the world better. And I think that psychology helps us to at least understand, or some different psychologies can help us to understand the kind of scale of the problem that's facing us. Because you know, one of the things that comes across from, from what Dustin was saying is, is this kind of, this idea about fear. And then what Rudy talks about is, is this idea about the kind of, the, the kind of, the, the cult of personality, the kind of fascist savior that comes along. Uh, and you see these things just repeating in history. I loved it how you said, first time around, these things seem like tragedy. The second time, it's like comedy. Um, and, and I'm of a certain age, and I can remember things are coming around for the second and third time as well. And you think to yourself, you know, why are we not learning from these? Why are we not seeing these patterns? But it's almost like, the younger generations have never had them. They've never had those experiences. And 
most of my life is spent with young people, teaching young people in a university. That's most of the interactions I have. They're the generation, they're the people I, I mix with. And I can tell you that we've got, and it's not to try to be denigrating about students, mm -hmm. but if the students I teach are in any sense representative of young people today, <clears throat> and I think they probably generally are, they're so fearful. And I think that fear, that angst, that, that, that kind of anxiety that young people have that I teach, it's not just me teaching them. They haven't got anxiety and fear about me personally. <laughs> they have this kind of anxiety and fear about the world, about how they're going to make their place in the world, about what kind of a future they're going to have, about are they going to be able to afford a home? I read something this week that talked about 30 years ago, the average house price in Britain was about two and a half times the average salary. And now it's more than 10 times. And in London, 30 times the average salary. And these are real existential problems. The job market, the competition for jobs, even graduate jobs, is so fierce now that students have written about this, <clears throat> are cheating in their essays. They're buying essays, contract cheating, because Cheating is, 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 is preferable to failing. And so with every single graduate job now, having over a hundred applicants for it, who are all qualified for the job, <clears throat> the pressure that's on young people is incredible. And so when you see all of these global and regional kind of uh, happenings that you're talking about, I don't think that I think I differ from Dustin in the sense that I don't think that the war in Ukraine or Russia in Ukraine has failed. I don't see things as success and failure like that. <clears throat> I think the world is the way it is because of the powerful forces that are in the world. They want things to be the way they are. When you talk about Donald Trump as being like, we should he's appalling well of course you know i would i would agree with you on some level but i think i think it misses the point my when i look at people like donald trump i, I kind of think about this quote once nietzsche said he said we have made eunuchs of ourselves so that we may come and go in the harem of world cultures now i think it's probably not a very politically correct thing to say today but i mean what he was talking about was philosophers or sociologists i interpret it as that we are, we're going around looking at the world, but we can't really do or say anything about it. And I think you look at someone like these world leaders, I mean, I think that, that, that God, if there is a God, he's got a weird sense of humor. To actually put someone like Boris Johnson, and, 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 you know, and now we've got Rishi Sunak, and to get Donald Trump, and then you got like Marie Le Pen in France seeming to be getting a lot of traction. And, and what Rudy talks about, he's been here before, he's seen this many, many times. And I think when people are fearful and they're rendered fearful, they're, they're, their very existence is so precarious and uncertain. I don't think they have the ability or capacity or dare I say humanity in the way that I tend to understand that term, for their fellows. I think it, what it does is, it, from a psychological perspective, even my reading of Freud, it makes them retract. So I think the project I'd like to think about would be going back to a time in, in, a, in each country or, 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 or thinking about a time in the world where we were closer to the kind of world that we would like to see in this conversation than we are today. And think about what was different about that world there? What was different in terms of the relationships between people? Were they, were they, I think that you'll find that if I think about it in terms of Britain, when people romanticize about British heyday, it's when there was full employment in this country. It's when there was 90% of people going to, to a Christian church each Sunday. It's when people were getting, each year, they felt that their standard of livings were improving. 
And people had more charity for each other then. People cared more about each other then. Because I think that they could do. I think that they had, they had the capacity to be generous. They had the capacity to, to think about others and not just be selfishly thinking about themselves. And today, I think people are rendered so precarious and so insecure, I don't think they have that capacity. I, I work with, in a law school, 50% of my, of my work is in a law school, and 50% is in a sociology and politics school. And in the law school, I was speaking to a colleague the other day, this is, because I like to put things into reality, then we can actually see what, what we're really talking about. And he's been a friend of mine for a long time, and, and he was almost crying in the street speaking to me. Now, this is a law professor, a law professor at the top of, 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 of his game, right? And I won't say many more personal things about his life or his wife's employment, but he and his wife have got, you know, upper middle class jobs. And he was almost crying in the street because we've just had interest rate changes over here with the Bank of England. His mortgage came up for renewal and the bank have told him because of the new interest rate that he and his wife, and he's a law professor with an average mortgage, my two children have exactly the same amount on mortgage for their homes. And this law professor and his wife who is a teacher the bank will not renew his mortgage because he and his wife don't earn enough money to pay their average mortgage in this country. That man doesn't have much time for worrying about what's happening with anybody else's life or what's happening around the world. His existential crisis is so overwhelming that he can't think about anything at all because now he's thinking, I'm gonna to have to sell my home and try and buy something cheaper but we're having a property market crash over here because everybody's trying to sell their homes. And these are the kind of structural, social structural forces that I think are making people not have the capacity to think about anybody else because everybody is too busy trying to survive themselves. And when I say everybody, I don't, obviously I don't mean the top 10%. The top 10%, they are the ones that create the world in which the rest of us live in. And I think that this neoliberalism that seems to be just spreading and spreading and spreading, as an ideology, neoliberalism is about, don't worry about anybody else, only worry about yourself. And I think that these two things work very well together. You render people in such a precarious position that they don't have the capacity for anybody else, and then they just, even if they're doing okay, they still don't worry about anybody else because tomorrow could be precarious. We're always in uncertainty and we're always in instability. So I think that, I think we, we need to actually start to make these things visible. We got to use social theory to actually make these things visible. But I don't think it's just speaking to each other. I don't think it's just speaking to an academic audience because if we want to bring people, if we want to change the world, we have to bring people along with us. And so the projects I do, which I'm sure you're aware of, and they seem to occupy an awful lot of my time. I was on the phone this morning to a mother who wouldn't stop crying for over an hour about her son who's in prison, who she says is innocent. I've looked into the case. I can't see any reliable evidence that this chap did what he's supposed to have done. I'm working on five other cases very deeply now, people in prison who are saying they're innocent. And, and I have these projects where I'm trying to engage the public through these more journalistic type projects that I have. You know, journalistic type articles about what's wrong with the criminal justice system, for instance. And then I've got this idea to get Empowering the Innocent TV, where I want to interview people and make these interviews available as a kind of precursor to trying to mobilize public support for the changes I would like to see in this particular small area of society. 
And I think, I think we need to just be doing things. I remember some years ago, I met a chap called Lucio Erturbia, who you might have heard of. Do, do you know Lucio? No? He was an anarchist. Um, he was brought up in the Basque region in Spain. Um, they made a film about Lucio. He was a friend of Che Guevara, but he called Che Guevara a wimp. He said Che Guevara would go so far, but then he'd stop. He wouldn't go all the way. So he fell out with Che Guevara when they were trying to um, just, just flood the United States with fake currency. Um, and he gave a talk in Bristol. He's in his 80s now. He's about 88 now, something like that. He's just a youngster compared to Rude, but he's, uh, he's getting on in his years. And someone in the audience was saying, because there's a lot of students there, and I remember speaking to some of the students, I said, what do you do, you know, to try to make the world a better place? Well, well, I come to things like this. Okay, you come to a talk, you listen to a man speaking, yeah, what, what else do you do? Well, I'm a member of Amnesty International, and, and sometimes I send out letters that they, that they ask me to, to kind of send out. I said, did they ever change anything? No. Well, people don't reflect. They just want to think they're doing something and they're not reflecting that the things that they're doing are not going to make any difference at all. So I think we need to think about, about, about that. I think we need to think about how do we make the differences that we want to make? And I think they start off local and I think they work out from that. I don't think we can think global and work in. I think we have to work locally and work outwards from that on, on, on small problems. And what Lucio said this night to the audience was, it doesn't matter what you do, just do, yeah. some, just do something. It doesn't matter what you do. So if we all just do something, no matter what it is, we will change the world. We will make it, um, but I think that where social theory comes into that, is we've got to, as you talked about, Justin, we've got to help people to understand not just the problems that are in the world, but also the, the kind of the forces that are preventing change. And, and I think if we do that, so I think that just, just, have, have, just have a debate in society, have, 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 a, have a meeting with your students. You know, just book a village hall once a month, get people in. What are the social problems? Well, we've got 10 homeless people in our town. Let's fix that problem. Let's just fix it. Let's have no homeless people in our town. And I think that's how you do it. You just keep making the world a better place one person at a time. And I think that's all we can do in that sense. But I think our work is, 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 is broader than that. Um, in highlighting, like I said, what's wrong with things and, and how we think they can be changed. And I think there's an awful lot of emphasis on the former, like saying what's wrong with the world. And I think there's an awful lot less and more can be done about engaging with the challenges to actually bringing about some of the reforms that we'd like to see, some of the changes that we'd like to see. Um, and dare I say, some of the transformations that we'd like to see, because I think we'd all like to see quite fundamental transformations to, 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 to the social structures of our societies. Um, and it's, it's going to make you unpopular. People are not going to like you. People are going to criticize you. You won't have many friends. The upside of that is you don't have to buy many Christmas cards for people at Christmas because you don't have many friends on your Christmas card list. Um, I don't have any. Uh, <laughs> well, he played. But the thing is, it's, it's, it is lonely. You know, because what we also learn from psychology is that whether you, whether you want to see us as a herd or you want to see us as a horde, most of the human population that we have just wants to follow what Rudy talks about. 
somebody who looks like they're going to be powerful and have the answer. And they're just walking us over the cliff. And it's very, very difficult when you've got a frightened herd or a frightened horde, however you want to see the general population. It's very difficult to kind of turn that horde or herd away from the cliff. Um, but I think that is the challenge. All right. Thank you, Michael. It was very interesting. Give you a lot to think about. Absolutely. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much, Mike. Now the floor is yours, Mehdi. Oh, okay. Mehdi, Thanks. Mehdi. Yes. Mehdi yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, I enjoyed very much the, uh, uh, the presentations of the talk by uh, Rudy, uh, Dustin, Michael. I'm looking forward to hearing you talk. I always thought I was going to go last, but let me just say before I um, get too excited because of all the things I've heard and I need to think about uh, that I um, also in line with what uh, Dustin and, and Michael and to some extent really said, I've been thinking about really the plight of humanity. And so um, about a month ago or so, uh, well, it was a couple of years ago, I came across a, um, an interesting presentation um, by a, not presentation, sorry, by a, uh, came across a, a book and review of the book and then related articles uh, regarding um, human beings and what really human beings are all about what it, in terms of their uh, agency, uh, that is the individual itself and the larger society. And I thought, you know, that's the question that uh, is as that there has been um, um, there's been sort of um, uh, dominating the discourse uh, in political economy. And let me just say that political economy, of course, is, you know, uh, there is this mainstream political economy that involves uh, budgeting policies, public policies, you know, who pays for what, who gets what, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then there is the, um, that, that by the way, within the mainstream political economy, of course, the solutions are sought within the structure as is, uh, the structure of society. Uh, the idea that the structure has to change in order for us to make a difference doesn't really uh, enter the discussion. So then comes, of course, the radical political economy and the critique of mainstream political economy. Uh, perhaps one of the most um, brilliant um, political economists who provided a critique of mainstream political economy was Karl Marx and some of his cohorts in the 19th century. And of course, Karl Marx was primarily interested uh, in, in the uh, produ reproduction of the system through mechanisms such as commodification of everyday life, uh, through reification, alienation, false consciousness, and a whole host of other things that we're all, we're all familiar with. And so to Karl Marx, then the solution is really to abandon the system you know, that demands our misery to abandon the system that is creating this problem for us. And that is the entire, the totality of the socioeconomic and political structure. And parenthetically, let me just say this, that outside of Europe, um, you know, that I have something that I've been working on and sort of translation and you guys will see probably, hopefully soon um, with the help of uh, Dustin, and that is a uh, critique of mainstream Islamic political economy by Ali Fariati. It's a devastating critique and how that whole system really is structured in a way that breeds you know, alienation, exploitation, stupefaction, and, and a whole bunch of other things. So anyway, so moving to be beyond the 19th century political economy, uh, in particular, a radical critique, uh, we see that some of those concepts, as, as Michael pointed out, you know, we still have this, these problems trying to communicate the, the, these concepts to the general public. For instance, proletariat, as he 
but it, you know, how do we how do we convince people that are proletarian? You know, that there are wage earners, that are being exploited, that this whole system is a structure on their back and without them, of course, the system will not survive. And so, um, and, and also, you know, uh, Marcuse's uh, idea that we have to reorient, rename, and maybe add to the, the, the conceptual repertoire, reservoir, in order to be able to describe the complexity of, of the contemporary world. Uh, and so we have seen individuals from the um, uh, peripheral regions of the world, uh, from the non-European part of the parts of the world, that have tried to incorporate some of the unique cultural aspects of their existence, economic um, life of uh, the political life of their societies, and conceptualize, and they have. In, in many ways synthesize with the Western conceptual framework that already existed. And one of the individuals who's well known in the non-European, non-Western world, of course, is Foucault, Michel Foucault. And Foucault, of course, is has just about, has everything to say about everything, something to say about everything. If he, if he doesn't say anything, he is says something because all the uh, interpretation of what Foucault meant in some other areas. Several concepts that, um, that, that really contributed to this expansion of, has contributed to the expansion of the, uh, our understanding or better understanding of the uh, contemporary political economy um, are things like biopolitics that Foucault in many ways is looking at it not necessarily as a negative thing, but it says it's the power to define and manage human life, okay? And of course, um, this biopolitics could end up becoming a thanato politics uh, or a necro politics, meaning that the ability of the sovereign to justify mass killing, uh, to destroy the population because the population, because death has a value, has a market value. Not because humanity is, you know, uh, is sacred, we have to manage it. No, 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 no. It, 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 it's in fact, uh, the murder of individuals, the member of, the murder of, of in, uh, people in society is rationalized and justified because there is really no way uh, escaping the systemic contradictions that exist. And therefore the system has to kill in order to survive all of those contradictions. And we see that by the way, as we speak in some parts of the world. So the, the biopolitics is then a concept that Foucault introduced, but then was borrowed by uh, Achille Mbibi from Cameroon. Uh, in fact, he has a book, he published it, he, he uh, used the term necropolitics in 2003, and then he, the book was out back in 2016, and then we uh, translated into English in 2019. But what Mbebe is saying that, uh, what, what he does is really, he provides a nice synthesis between uh, uh, Foucault's uh, biopolitics, the notion of biopolitics, and anti-colonial a struggle of, uh, presented or the strategy, anti-colonial strategy presented by uh, Franz Fanon and others. Um, that it, the, Foucault has a statement that, you know, the colonial, colonial genocide. And then in fact, the whole uh, enterprise is based on the genocide of others uh, in order to survive. And in fact, in an expansion of this concept, and Bebe is saying that, it's not just the, and, and others, by the way, it's not just the, the colonial subjects that are being subject to genocidal behavior and policies, but, it, but it's also the population, segments of population within the non-European, within the Western Europe, within North America, they're also subject to that. And I think Dustin pointed out quite a few of those things uh, that uh, these um, authors have in mind. Um, the biopower, by the way, was again, was another concept that was introduced by Foucault. And, and then um, uh, 
uh, Agamben has this, uh, this uh, whole idea that there is this um, homo sacer and then uh, um, that is a legal term, uh, someone who can be killed without, with impunity, without anybody asking as to why the person got killed, was murdered. Uh, it's that concept that biopower in many ways presents that ability or provides an ability to the sovereign state to kill. Um, so the combination of biopower and biopolitics, uh, in many ways, it becomes necro politics. But I, what I would like to do is really that I've been taking some notes on reading on the, on the subject matter, is that I think a necro political economy, that is the the synthesis of necropolitics and necroeconomics is really what we need to look at uh, the totality. Um, so in, in describing the uh, racism, the ethnocentrism, the environmental degradations, commodification of death in many ways explains uh, all of these, uh, that commodification of death actually is um, the end goal because therein lies some value for the market economies, for capitalism. Capitalism, which is really predicated on uh, racism, on exploitation, on alienation. And so uh, the question is then, how do we apply the necro political economy and necro politics to the current reality that we have? For instance, we have these uh, counter efforts on the part of the uh, capital uh, to perhaps um, minimize the impact of global climate change. One is called decarbonization, okay? Decarbonization or the smart cities and green gentrification, greening in general, a whole bunch of other things, recycling. All of those things are introduced acting as if those are the solutions to the problem that they have created. Yet studies show that actually smart cities, green gentrification, greening, uh, recycling, all of those things are another way, other ways of making money at the expense of the general public. That is, by green gentrification, you generate, you create an environment, or a small city, you create an environment in which only the wealthy and the affluent can afford to, to buy uh, 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 those properties to live in. And um, it is in this context that I think we have to look at the the totality of, of what is what is capitalism these days and how what are the manifestations of this uh, capitalist um, enterprise uh, when it comes to individuals, when it comes to societies, communities, uh, humanity at large. Um, you know, Michael says something about hum humanism, uh, humanity, but yeah, humanity, I think we lost uh, the meaning of we really don't have, we haven't, th we haven't thought about really what is it what does it take to be a human being in society? And so in this, in this, in this context, that we need to reincorporate some of the concepts that are uh, created uh, to the conceptual framework that exists that we have inherited from 18th century, 19th century Western philosophy, and to see if that can enable us to understand reality much better. And so on that basis, then we can move forward as to the question is, how do we create a, a unified front, whether it's a working class uh, uh, stuff in Kansas City or in Tehran or in Cameroon, how do we get this alliance in order to make a difference? In other words, what is bad for me is bad for everybody else. What's good for me is not necessarily good for everybody else. In other words, what I have to do is to put myself in the position of others to, to walk in their moccasins, to understand their reality, and then I can relate to it. Um, that's all I have to say, but this is in the, in the uh, you know, in progress. This is a work in progress, and hopefully we'll have something to say. Uh, maybe I'll send you guys something by way of a note um, to see what you guys think about this, okay? All right, thank you, Mahdi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mehdi. Uh, I'm, really, I'm really not sure if uh, the net will really be very helpful, but I try my best. You know, when I was uh, thinking about this seminar, 
uh, it was, I think, last month, which uh, coincided with the day of uh, World Philosophy Day. And uh, there were about 13 questions put forward to different philosophers and thinkers around the world. And they wanted to know, for example, what each of these philosophers, thinkers think about the most important and pressing questions before humanity. For example, uh, I read for you 13 of those questions and then I try to give my brief uh, outlook as well. The first questions which may be put forward before humanity is, can humans overcome the enormous gap between their moral technological capacity to destroy and their moral capacity? The second important question which could be raised is, will we successfully address the climate crisis or not? Some of these questions were in uh, each of your presentation as well. The third question is, how does dehumanization continue to grow upon democratic soils? I think, for example, Dustin was somehow addressing this question as well. The fourth question is, the only question is whether any of the destruction we have already inflicted on our world is reversible. And if so, how this can be done? The fifth question is, is it possible for us to get our collective acts together to allow us, other animals, and the planet to survive? Maybe Mehdi somehow was talking about this as well, unified front of humanity. The sixth question is the primarily, the primary philosophical challenge is not different for the 21st century than it has always been, namely, to provide a credible overall account of the world and ourselves. The next question is, what would constitute human moral bio-enhancement? The eighth question is, the biggest question for the 21st century remains Socrates' question, how should one live? The ninth question is, how do we design and implement digital technologies in a way that they enhance well-being and protect human rights and the environment? The tenth question which could be raised is, how will philosophy, social theory, critical thinking influence the big conversation and motivate those who are not crushed by the search for subsistence, safety, freedom and fulfillment to address the needs of others who are. This was maybe raised by Michael when he was talking about issues about that professor and people like that who are, oh, oh, they are so preoccupied with their own anxieties and problems, which don't have the capacity or energy or time to think about others. The 11th question is, what is time? What do we mean by time? Neither philosophers nor physicists have clear answers about the question of time. And what is the difference between time and the social time? And how these discrepancies between social times in different societies affect our understanding of the most pressing questions? The next question is, is there going to be a 22nd century for humanity? I mean, the way we are living and the way we are conducting ourselves, is there any possibility or <coughs> any hope for the next century? Is it possible? Is it possible to live on? The last question is, what is this reality we have, born, we have been born into without our prior consent? Who are we? Who is anyone? or the question of politics, of identity, who we are, who am I, and what is the difference between these mm -hmm. different identities, and how can we somehow find 
a common denominator to bring these different identities into somehow to cooperate and live together, coexistence. And what was actually after reading these questions struck my mind was that there was somehow, you know, uh, I think the position we are or the place we live or the geography somehow affect our understanding as well. I think one of the general questions which we are facing as a humanity is the question of authoritar authoritarianism versus democratic tendencies which we are witnessing in the world. But if we, if we are living, for example, in a context like Iran or Middle East, West Asia, or somewhere outside Europe, there is another question apart from authoritarianism versus democratic tendencies. And that is the question, the marriage of religion with authoritarianism and with democratic tendencies. These are the pressing questions, apart from all the questions which we have, uh, which I have raised, religion is intertwined or is married to authoritarian interpretations, or if there is a possibility that religion is interpreted with some kind of democratic interpretations and tendencies, and what in turn affects the way we run, the, we run society and how that affects our understanding of ourselves, our societies and the other. And there were the questions which uh, Dustin actually raised as well about xenophobia and uh, icophobia. Uh, these are the questions I think uh, which, as, uh, which we can ask as social critical theorists or philosophers with some kind of uh, critical thinking as well. And I hope uh, in the near future we can have maybe a, uh, not only online, but maybe uh, we can have actually in person, we can have a seminar and talk about these questions, these pressing questions, which are affecting our humanity at large and different societies which we are finding ourselves in. And I think we who are coming from different traditions and different part of the world, maybe we can find somehow a little bit uh, a, a kind of different language which could actually bring us together and try to establish or maybe to pave the way uh, for the next generation, apart from if we have different religions, different races, different traditions, and different, for example, nationalities, and don't and don't get stuck in these and try to find some kind of some kind of intercivilizational language and paradigm for debate and discussions. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. All right, now, so I think we're going to move to general discussion. So if anyone has any questions of anyone else, feel free. Oh, Michael. Thanks. Thank you. I mean, what I was going to say is, I think it just kind of adds to what I was, what I was going to say, but also it kind of touches on what Mehdi says yeah. and what Sayed was saying. Um, I think part of the problem and part of the reason for the kind of anxiety, the, this ex existential anxiety that we see, is that we've we've got to a stage of technological advancement now, where you know the kind of biopower um, kind of ideas and uh, that, that Mehdi was talking about, they become a real kind of concern, because because what we're seeing in this country over the last forty years is 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 as we've kind of moved to more and more kind of, we might say for the want of a better word, artificial intelligence solutions, where we're even talking in this country now, not just about, like we have a photograph in our family of, of my father in the 1950s, you know, digging, my father's Irish, digging, digging a hole in, in, in you know, with, with, with hundreds of other men, 
just all in there digging. And now you, you, you see you see one machine, great big machine, with a couple of people walking walking next to it. And we see it in supermarkets, we see these ATMs came in, uh, supermarkets now, there's no people on these, on these machines. They, they've now got um, entire hypermarkets, I understand now in America, where you just <coughs> walk in, you take whatever you want and you can just walk out and it knows what, what you're taking. It's like, a, it's like, you know, some of the science fiction films that we've seen are, 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 are really kind of just thinking through the kind of sociology of, of, of some of this technology. Where we just have our credits just you know digital clock on our on our arm or something like that. And these kind of ideas are becoming a reality now, where more and more people um, have just been in Bauman's terms, they've just been made redundant. There's no need for these people anymore. The world has been made the way it is. I mean, I saw some technology recently. I mean, I was I thought it was amazing and totally frightening. It's got this machine. Right, and it can actually, it's like, it, it looks like something that you put icing on a cake with, but it's huge. And when he was going around this, this, this um, template, like, um, what do you call them machines that, 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 that oh, what do you call them? Like a 3D printer type machine. So oh. this thing was, was, was huge and, and it can make a house in, in three days. It just squirts concrete round the template. By the time it comes round it, it's the best insulated house that's on planet Earth at the moment. They're building a whole village of these in Mexico at the moment to test it out. This And, you know, they're amazing machines. They're incredible. But they're all about engineering human beings out of the process. Just like it was the Luddites warned of this in, in Victorian England, said they used to break the spinning jennies because they knew that these machines were the start of, of engineering human beings out of the process. So human beings aren't required. And what we're seeing is, even though there is the wealth that there is in the country, in this country, in the world, you know, the ideology of the people who've got that wealth is, there are exceptions where wealthy people do TED Talks and say, I can only wear one pair of shoes. I can only drive one car. Why do I need, you know, 50 billion pounds? There are people like that, but, but they are anomalies. Generally speaking, the heart and mind of the person who makes that amount of money despises the poor and doesn't see them as any, it's like Ayn Rand. They don't see them as having any value apart from just making, being a commodity to exploit, to make them money. And so you go around this country now, and we've talked about it before, you go around America and these Rust Belt places where the factories have gone and the people have just been thrown away, disposed of. There's no need for them anymore. And if they can scrape their own living, well, good luck to them. But there's going to be no investment in those areas because there's no need to invest in those areas because the neoliberal ideology is we're not going to get anything back for the investment, so we're not going to do it because everything's only seen in economic terms. And so I think this kind of this increasing technological advancement and the increasing, you know, <clears throat> redundancy or disposal of human beings who are deemed to be no longer of any value, I think that's a major problem that needs to be overcome. And I think, I think, I think thinking needs to be done around how do we actually move, you know, so we don't fall into the kind of biopower kind of. <clears throat> apocalyptic kind of vision that we would all fear right you know how do we how do we actually like you call it necro um you know um biopolitics you know how do we actually envisage a world and i've been talking about this for flipping donkey's years that we we need to imagine first of all a post-industrial world where we can all actually just flourish and become you know, to realize our potentials, whatever they may be. Because unless we can actually imagine it and start to actually depict what it might look like, I think that was probably one of Marx's failures because by saying that, you know, come the revolution, we'll all be living in this utopian kind of um, communist dream. And when people pressed him, my understanding is he said, well, I don't know what it's going to look like. People will just have to make it themselves. I think that was that was a mistake. 
because people don't have the imagination for that. I think that we need to imagine what we want it to be, and then we have to have to actively make it like that. That's what I believe. And just being wishy-washy, saying, well, I don't know what it looks like. That's when the fascists come in. That's when it becomes something which is, which is apocalyptic. So I think that we now live in a world where clearly, you know, people don't need to, a lot of people don't need to work in the conventional jobs. And, and we just need to start to think about human beings in different ways. You know, humanity in the kind of way that I understand it. Um, and that is one of the most pressing problems that Sayed spoke about, I think. Uh, and the fear, the fear is that, and that's what fuels all these conspiracy thoughts. I mean, almost everybody I know, because of this insecurity and uncertainty and mistrust in the government, etc., and power, you, you hear the most fantastical conspiracy theories. You know, don't have the COVID jab because they're trying to wipe out the entire world population. You know, people genuinely believe stuff like that. Um, and that makes them retract and not participate in politics and stuff like that. So there are forces at play which are trying to separate us, alienate us, not in the Marxist sense, more in the kind of psychological sense. Uh, and we are in an alienated world at the moment. And these are some of the challenges. Uh, but I think the answer is to imagine, make blueprints, well, what a world look like looks like post-industrial. Go ahead, Marty. <clears throat> um, you know, it's interesting, Michael, you mentioned these giant machineries that are now um, making human beings much more expendable than ever before. Uh, I mean, you know, in reference to your reference from Luddites, you know, for a long time, they presented a lot of as it was lunatics, you know, they didn't like progress and they raided factories and broke the machineries and this and that. But in reality, they knew exactly what awaits you, man, that these guys are not going to have any source of livelihood if these machines are going to substitute, be substituted for them in the factories. And now, and during the fourth industrial revolution, we have now this information, new technology, new, you know, um, I mean, there's so many different terms describing this reality that the question is, do we really have enough job for people to go around? We world population just had 9 billion, you know, on a 29% of the globe, which is land and everybody's struggling. We don't have a shortage, by the way, we don't have a shortage. But the idea that there is a necro politics and necro economics at work is, I think, is very real. That they're trying to kill off as many people as possible. Not that somebody gets up in the morning and says, "Well, we don't need these great unwash. You know, let's just, you know, I don't know, turn them into dog food." But the fact of the matter is that the reality of it is, by through their policies, even they don't think about that. This is the reality. The global climate crisis kills what? What kind of people? Poor people on the planet, right? And these are the people we build green cities, we build we build the small cities, but then we drive out all these people to the lowland area, which are very susceptible to flood and a lot of other problems, and you know the viruses and and the bacteria and it just you know on and on and on, and it it makes you wonder if there is a concerted effort to kill a big chunk of the population because we're, we can't really stop people from producing because death itself is a commodity. It's a money-making you know, uh, development. Uh, and so, and I think you know, the sad part of it is that people who are supposed to know these things don't know. I remember that when Donald Trump went to West Virginia and was talking to those miners over there, he was, he promised them that he's going to save their jobs. Yet, even then, as he was talking, there are giant machinists have already replaced hundreds of mine workers. And that was just the beginning of things, you know, that has been developing and more and more technology has been introduced in the world. Right? Yet these people were cheered them on. They had no clue that the reality is different than what this politician is saying. And I don't like to concentrate on individual personalities and politicians. I really think it's the structure that 
you know, pushes these people up front. These are the people that are the spokesmen for the establishment. I mean, establishment sounds like a terrible thing, but the reality of it is there is the socioeconomic and political uh, reality. I, I'm bothered by the fact that some people say, well, Fox News is, you know, on the, on the right side and CNN is on the left. I'm thinking, oh my God, whatever happened to the balance of power? Both of them are there. The reason they're there to make money, they're corporate media. You see, but they have, it seems that there's a division of labor. Hey, I'm concentrated on these things and you concentrate on those things. Yet everybody, all of them have their own followers, you know, and they can, they can even call people uh, to arm and, and destroy things and kill people. The reality is, right? I mean, we do have this, you know, AM radio and wave or, uh, talking about a wave of, you know, right wingers and left wingers alike. They really are, they see that violence is a solution. So I think lack of consciousness, you know, class consciousness, lack of awareness, and, and that is a deliberate uh, attempt at denying people access to adequate information. You know, um, Varoufakis mentioned something about a techno-feudal world. Uh, how wonderful, that, that's a wonderful concept. I mean, that captures the essence of really the te technologically driven um, mass communication that these people with corporate media that are controlling the flow of information and, and when they, they open the, the gate, they decide what kind of information um, to, to send out. And so this feudal techno feudalism that we have really is, is also part of the establishment that is in many ways is very much uh, in the business of necropolitics and, and necro -economy. So I have to say, by the way, one other thing, uh, you know, um, Rudy mentioned the, um, was it Acker? 800 years ago, there was a uh, death sentence against him of some sort. Um, is it interesting that- uh, Excommunication, excommunication. Excommunication, yeah. But Spinoza has also a 460 year death sentence against him by the, uh, the uh, rabbis. Uh, exactly, against... <laughs> yes. Right. So this is the reality uh, we live in. Exclusive personalities. It's representative, right. And so as long as we have they, these authoritarian, you know, establishment, institutionalized religions, you know, to have speaking on behalf of God, and they want to save the, you know, the great, you know, um, sheeps. Uh, and, and, you know, well, obviously we we'll have another problem here. You know, how do we convince people that religion is supposed to liberate, not to dominate and not to demean and degrade? Okay, thank you. That's all I have to say. Okay. Rudy, did you have something you want to yeah. say? <clears throat> uh, all of us said something about Marx and maybe that he is a little bit obsolete or whatever, but there is one concept by him, this surplus labor, surplus right. labor. That means that a small group of people lives from the surplus uh, labor, which the masses of the people are doing beyond their salary. So uh, I mentioned that once uh, to communists who were in the government in Moscow, and they said, well, you are still talking about surplus value. Uh, isn't that obsolete? I said, if this has become obsolete to you, your revolution has become obsolete soon. Yeah. So the uh, seldom this is mentioned. So. If I have my cleaning ladies coming in, two of them, I pay them $20, it gets $10, but I pay $120. So they get $20 and the owner who sits in Florida and does nothing, he gets the $100 surplus value. That is what the whole system rests on, Absolutely. this contradiction. So it can also not be reformed because then um, the people who, do not get the surplus value anymore, they would not exist any longer. But by accumulating the surplus value, they can engage in propaganda, they can pay parties in their own interest and so on. So it seems to me that this is a core concept, surplus value, which not only Marx had, but other uh, uh, political economists, that, that to think in those terms would not be obsolete, I think. It is very much with us 
and it has become much more radical, this reality, than it was at the time of Marx. Yeah, you know, I think that the more radical it gets, the more it lays the groundwork for the Messiah, you know, the Messiah yeah. authoritarian. Right. Religion. Yeah. That's right. what I'm going to kill. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the most amazing things about the Trump uh, running in, in 2016 is because if you listen to what he said, he promised socialism to the workers. We're going to, you know, we're going to go after the politicians that are allowing these guys to export the jobs. We're going to go after these big corporations who are doing this to you. I mean, he promised them all socialism. And it was Clinton who had the same old, same old, you know, neoliberalism, yeah. market, blah, 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 blah. You know, and so the workers were instinctively, you know, attracted to that socialistic promise. But then he gave them the opposite. And, you know, he gave them spectacle or whatever. So I think, you know, as you said, Rudy, the worse and worse it gets, the more extreme the extraction of surplus value uh, comes, the more and more it's likely that the masses are going to turn to someone who says, I am going to slay the chaos. And by and large, that is anti-democratic, authoritarian. It's on the far right. That's the magic yeah. helper. Yeah. That is what Fromm yeah. and Freud and these called the magic helper. The father the, who who helps people in panic and so on. So um, that is where the authoritarian personality is connected. So I, th I think that one should, of course, there are things maybe Marx in his old age became a little bit more authoritarian than he was in his youth. So then people concentrated more on his youth, which is all right. But a concept like a surplus value the private appropriation of collective surplus labor is the contradiction. It should be the collective appropriation of collective labor. But that is the core uh, contradiction of capitalism, which has to be overcome if there should be peace, because otherwise the struggle between those two sides, the exploited and the exploiter will continue even if it is forgotten and people concentrate more on cultural conflicts and so on, this economic issue remains unchanged. And that people are not aware of it was already the case in terms of Marx. That means the people who suffer are not uh, conscious of who they are and what role they play and how they are cheated. They take it for granted. So if somebody has a good salary or so, he may not bother about the surplus value who, which is stolen from him. He may work one day a week for his salary, which I found out in uh, uh, car workers here. They worked one day for their salary and five days for their master. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a core concept which has not become obsolete. No, I mean, I just like to say, I mean, I wasn't trying to imply that these, <laughs> that these concepts have become obsolete. What I was trying to say was, um, or what I meant to say was um, that, that these concepts have stopped to have any resonance with the public. So I think that a concept that was kind of um, put forward uh, a few years ago by somebody in Bath University, his surname was Guy, I can't remember his first name. Um, Guy Standing. It, it, was, it was a concept called the precariat. Guy Standing, yeah. Great guy, yeah. standing. So I think I wasn't, I mean, I, I think that surplus value, I think proletariat, I mean, I, I still think the idea of two broad classes, although, you know, there's lots of different differentials in, in terms of salary, but even somebody who's on a relatively high salary, you know, they lose their job. It's, it's curtains for them. Yeah. Um, what I was trying to say is that these, I think that, there seems to be a resistance to some of these concepts because they see them as dated. And I think that what you have to do is you have to kind of reinvent new language for the same, because like you say, the relationships of power are still the same, right? So I think that, I'm not trying to say that Marx is obsolete, but, but some of the language perhaps needs to be kind of um, like tailored for how people want to understand things for, day, for today. Because as soon as you say Marx, as soon as you say proletariat, or as soon as you say bourgeoisie, or whatever, people just turn off. They stop listening because right. it's a kind of psychological kind of I don't know um, thing that they do. Medi, but, but it is it is I, the it is the bourgeois press, uh, yes. bourgeois owned press, which makes sure 
that yeah. people um, are skeptical about all these concepts. But you know, I think I think that the fact that Marxism became an institutional ideology, a state ideology. Uh, like Shariati says, you know, you want to kill an ideology, you want to destroy it, institutionalize it. You know, Marxism, in many ways, people don't want to listen to anybody who talk about Marx because Marxism all of a sudden brings to mind what? North Korea, Soviet Union, Cuba. Oh my God, I don't want to live there. I mean, I want my, praise my individual freedom. Therefore, I don't want to give up, you know, the whole notion of collective interest of society. That's, that's secondary. That doesn't enter the picture because what they see is what these people have been presented as Marxists, as, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Marxism in action. And so unfortunately we have that one. And I think, you know, if we were to read um, Polanyi, you know, uh, The Great Transformation, uh, I think that we have really, as we see in the, in the long, long durée, if you will, you know, Brodel's long durée, we see the consequence of all of these and institutionalizing these ideologies up to this point that all it seems have helped to save capitalism up to this point. You know, and the bourgeois press obviously he loves it. I mean, that's really what turns in all these, you know, turns out all of these stories, uh, good and bad. Uh, so the bourgeois, other... bourgeois press does an excellent job. For instance, um, the, the issue, the reports about uh, the Ukraine, which we mentioned, they just have to leave out the word provocation. And the whole thing appears in a completely different light. So the promise that there will be no movement of NATO beyond Germany, um, which Reagan made and so on, that this was broken and that this provocation goes on. So one sees the horrible images, but one doesn't ask what caused these horrible images. And if one knew that cause, what could, one could remove it and one could stop the provocations and one would stop the war. So leaving out one little word distorts the whole message in all details. You know, we have been able to, they have been able to crowd out meaningful, significant concepts. Just look at all this other garbage that people are bombarded with every or day. That yeah. one emphasizes the victims of the others, but one does not emphasize one's own victims in Yemen, for instance, or in Vietnam, for instance. Yeah. Or in Iraq, for instance, or in Nicaragua, for instance, wherever. Uh, yeah. I mean, we also have to remember that Marxists have done a good job delegitimating themselves as well. I mean, as Zizek always says, communism in the 20th, 20th century was an absolute catastrophe. I mean, Stalin is not something you want to bring back. Pol Pot is not something you want to bring back. Ceausescu yeah. is not something. I mean, they did a lot of damage to the yeah. very idea to undermine. Right. The, the, the truth about surplus value extraction as well. Yeah. So. yeah. But, yeah but that is also about Jesus and the church. Mm -hmm. Yes. You look at Jesus and what the church did. You have the same problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, one of the issues, the word communism, socialism, so it's so easily applied to some of these social constructs, you know, some of these systems, political systems. Who, whoever said, I don't even believe that Marx even believed in such a thing as communism as a political system. Particularly all religions not in Russia. A, uh, particularly all, not in Russia. Uh, particularly in Russia, right. They didn't really go through the process of, you know, productive forces being right. developed. And, but the fact is, all religions have a Messiah that is going to come someday and save him. And so Marxism is really no different. Communism is an ideal world. You cannot, it's impossible to reach it, but it means you got to move reality closer to that if possible. That's really, and I think Bernstein, you know, in the latter part of the 19th century, even, even um, you know, uh, Engels really were thinking that no, through democratic process, we can change this reality and move it towards socialism as the end, not communism as a, as a ultimate you know, but no, that is socialism as something that is much better, much fairer, more humane than what we have today. Yeah. I mean, we, we can have a nuanced conversation about, you know, were any of these places um, that you've spoken about, the Soviet system, etc. You, know, you know, did they measure up at all to what, you know, what Marx wrote about? And we can say that 
that they didn't, but it's not about that. It's about, it's about how these ideas are perceived, how these ideas are received, right. and perceptions of reality are reality. So as far as people are concerned, these, these ideas, um, you know, they're not just going to kind of, you know, tomorrow we can kind of start speaking in this language again and, and people are going to accept it. So, of course, Rudy's right. And I mean, if you want to see what Marx meant by alienation, you go to some of these former mining towns where you've got 80 percent of the population not working and you see real alienation there from their species being because they haven't learned to do anything without work. So they just they don't have a life because they don't. They're alienated from from themselves but it's about it's about taking i think it's about taking these things outside of the university and i think that you've got to engage with the public and we've got to try as far as we possibly can be to be public intellectuals i mean i know a lot of you do talk to the media and stuff and you've just got to carry on doing that and that's all you can do you can only do what you can do but you've just got to just just keep putting these ideas out like rudy yeah. was speaking about there like you're speaking about there just Try and educate people as best you can. Up to this think, point, you know, in this country now, it's almost like you could almost say that this country is, has a kind of death cult, right? Because a big idea among young people is this idea about YOLO. You only live once. There's no such thing as God. We've talked about it before. And if you only live once and you're only living for today because tomorrow may never come, you are in a very precarious position, even if you're wealthy because you're not actually planning for anything at all, because you're just in this moment. And a lot of this kind of pseudo psychology that's speaking of people, you know, it's a kind of a weird kind of, I don't know, um, interpretation of Zen Buddhism, it seems to me, that don't worry about anything apart from the present moment that you're in. Don't worry about anything else. And I'll just kind of say again, that if you want to make a better world, you know, if you're going to build a house, you have to have some plans for what the house is going to look like. You can't just say to a group of builders, well, there you are, you know, just go and build whatever you want to build. They're going to say, well, what do you want us to build? So we've got the skills to build it, but we don't know what you want us to build. So I think you have to have some kind of a plan, but that's uncomfortable, right? Because that puts us in a position of, you know, I don't want to tell anybody what kind of a house they should live in. I want them to choose what kind of a house they want to live in. So you always get this kind of situation where we can identify what the problems are, but when someone says what the solution is, we kind of go, well, we don't really want to tell you what to do. <laughs> so, yeah. so we don't get anywhere. Yeah. You know, educating the public, I just briefly, a couple of years ago, I asked my students to write about what if, what if, you know, will reduce the work week to 30 instead of 40 and sometimes 48 hours, you know, to reduce it to 30 hours, you know, and, and you'd be surprised that these are the children, the working class people, and they write, well, uh, I mean, then people are going to work less and they were not going to have enough workers and on and on and on, all in defense. You talk about false consciousness, and I really think we need to look at uh, different modes of expression of that problem, false consciousness. You know, that appears in so many different ways, you know, the society, within even family, within educational institutions, religious institutions, so all other forms. And that's really the critical concept, concept that we could get across. across. Well, this, this is, again, you know, another kind of Marxian type idea about, and, and Rudy talks about the media, and you talked about the media, Mehdi, is talking about Gramsci's idea of hegemony, how people actually think that their interests are served by internalizing bourgeois ideas. If there's somebody, yeah, there's somebody in the system. Yeah. That's what they're thinking. And the same thing is also true about Freudian concepts. <clears throat> Freud has also been repressed, like Hegel, and uh, somehow an unpleasant personality or um, and have pushed into the into the background. Mm -hmm. So but Freud with the Oedipus mm -hmm. complex has set the first, made the first stages toward discovering the authoritarian personality. And from there comes uh, from and Adorno and have intensified that by empirical studies and so on. So um, some things may uh, be, uh, you know, on the background, but to a large extent, Freud has been watered down and very often out of economic reasons that's simply too expensive 
to go through an analysis which changes the character and not only the behavior. So um, these somehow it is um, too much the uh, bourgeois propaganda which uh, thinks that certain thinkers are dangerous. So how did Hegel become this dangerous personality? Simply by being a Heracladian who says everything flows, that means also the ruling classes are flowing. And the ruling classes want to tell people that they are forever, that capitalism will be forever, that feudalism will be forever, that slaveholders will be forever. And when somebody teaches no, they also have their ending, they also will be superseded, that is dangerous. And then somebody becomes a persona non grata in universities and all schools, and that, of course, forms opinion. Yeah. Yeah, academy certainly is part of the problem, not part of the solution. I think the academy is, um, I, I think we're, we're, we're not sure really, we haven't decided, we're just there's so many, you know, and we have atomized everything. You know, there is no holistic, you know, um, if I teach economics and I talk about demography, then I'm criticizing. Why do you talk about that? That's not a see that. See the problem here we have. It's just that we don't address the totality, you know. And there's there's this disconnect between us and the larger society. We're training wage earners at the technical level, it seems, unfortunately. And look how philosophy, sociology, and others are degraded. You know, uh, we we think of sociology as social workers. You know. At that level of individual. We think of, uh, you know, psychology. I understand the Freudian approach to the problem with Freud that some people argue that, well, he concentrates on individual psychology, but then again, what's the origin of that behavior? If, if it's not society, what is that? Is that innate? You know, what, what does that come from? So there, in other words, there's this molding of larger society uh, that individual are subjected to. Yeah, who, who makes us think that way about Hegel or about Marx or about Freud? Where do these influences come from? And do they correspond to the interest of the common people or the interest of a small group? Yeah, probably not. I think they're just, you know, they're curious. Some of them are honest about it. They don't understand it. You know, if it's a society or an individual, it's a dialectic of the two. Mm -hmm. the, con the constant, you know, colliding of, of the interest of individual and the interest of society that is moving society forward. I don't, I don't know. Not to, I haven't thought about it much really, but the fact is that, you know, that's what some people suggest. Too much emphasis on individual psychology doesn't give us, you know, the dynamics within the group, uh, an understanding of dynamics. Or simply recommending that <clears throat> instead of listening to propaganda to read some of Freud, or instead of listening to bourgeois propaganda, to read some right. pages of uh, right. the last pages of the Capital or whatever. Mm -hmm. right. people, are, people are frightened to do that. I think that, I mean, Foucault talked about the. What but who makes us fearful? Absolutely. Right. The ruling class, yeah. But I, absolutely. You're, you're absolutely right. When I was speaking earlier, this concept fear, I mean, this is not accidental, it's intentional. And, and people succumb to it. Some people succumb to, succumb to it. Most people <clears throat> succumb to it. And as you say, it's through all the kind of ways in which we consume, consume knowledge. Now, Foucault talked about, you know, we should have something called the death of the author. If you say to somebody now, um, do you want to read this book? The first thing they'll say to you, who is it by? You say, don't worry who it's by. You just read it and you tell me what you think about it. They're even too frightened to tell you what they think about it because they just want to actually be in line with what the herd or the horde think about it. They want to be on the right side of things. They don't have the confidence to even read things for themselves and, and to say what they think about it and then to defend that. So if I read something and I think something about it and you read something and you think something different, I'm happy to debate you about that, about your interpretation of that. But a lot of people aren't. And, you know, people become their heritage. <clears throat> you know, we know how it works. But also how, how bad things are in socialistic countries. 
I mean, how bad Cuba is, for instance. Well, we have not really helped Cuba to bloom. We have an embargo of 50 years and so on. It is amazing that the island exists at all. So um, therefore, one has to see where all these things come from. Even as far as the Soviet Union is concerned, they did defeat the first wave of fascism, uh, of European fascism. The same states which are today NATO were also the states, the four million men with which Hitler marched into the Soviet Union. So, and that was conquered, that was an accomplishment in spite of all the bad things which have happened there, obviously. So then one has to balance the judgment between what, uh, what, what came and wrong and what uh, did succeed. And the main question, how far did it succeed to overcome, to resolve the contradiction between the private and the collective appropriation of surplus value? Mm -hmm. That would be a more objective uh, statement. Did it fail or did it have some, some success and, and so on? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> in terms of global capitalist accumulation, probably didn't you know help much, but in terms of um, I think solidifying uh, a group that it was relying on the surplus value that was created, I think they were very successful. They decided how to spend that surplus value. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just have a difficulty with the notion of communism or socialism as applied to these you know formations. I mean, we have Bernie here, and Bernie represents a Scandinavian form of social democracy. Mm -hmm. Does not do away with the ruling class, but taxes them and takes the tax money in order to have <laughs> education or free health insurance and so on. So that is, of course, a way. Now the communists would say that this is revisionism and so on but one should take those attempts seriously. Right. I like, I like uh, Bernie Sanders. I, I really like the man. And I think the man is probably more interested in maintaining the mm -hmm. capitalist system, uh, you know, with, with, uh, with, um, by instituting or implementing major reforms. I think you're right. He wants to take taxes from the rich and, you know, uh, pay attention to the social ills. Um, and, so so he right. takes some of the sur surplus value through right. taxation right. and brings it back to those who produced it. <clears throat> I think a lot of people get confused that they think that capitalism is the only form of commerce. Right. You right. know, Bernie right. wants commerce to continue. Alternative. Right. You know what I mean, it, commerce is a necessary part of, of human right. societies. It, it, it always has to exist. But what you do with that, the wealth, the profit, yeah. you know, where does it go, how it's divided up, that is, of course, what's in question. Sure. And if you remember right now, Bernie is being excoriated mm -hmm. as being a fake socialist by the the, the Red Brown Coalition, yeah. the coalition of fascists and, and communists, because he supports the defense of Ukraine yeah. against the war of aggression of Russia. Um, and so does the Pope. The Pope has now been saying that this is a new Holocaust in in. Right. And whatnot, and so he's being excoriated by the sure. far left, not yeah. particularly by socialists, but by the far left, yeah. who have yeah. allied themselves with the fascists. And it, it, and and so you know we have to remember this part of the clarifying the terms of where do these people line up. If you right. think Bernie was a communist, as Fox News would say, you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you, but you know, Russia today is yeah. the Soviet Union, you're going to be disappointed. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. The clarification. But you know, this then the problem would be with Bernie and others is that it seems once the elections are over, then they disappear. You know, that that bullhorn, that, that, you know, that buzzing, that discussion, all of those things seem stopped right there. That's the problem. But who's yeah. responsible for that? Yeah, I want these guys to continue. You know, don't limit that to political campaigns, you see. Yeah, people get excited and all that, you know, and then with funny hats and all this. But then after the what, what, what then? You see, everybody becomes, uh, you know, so numb to the reality of so they didn't get what they wanted. So, you know, life in, goes on. In, that's, in this, the bad, that's a problem. In this country at the moment, um, I think we're in, we're in a defining moment. In 1978, um, 79, they had something over here which was called the winter of discontent and there was a general strike 
So like almost every union went on strike and they didn't win, they lost because they, that was one of the defining moments in terms of globalization and outsourcing. That's when all the factories closed down, that's when all the mines closed, et cetera. It's when manufacturing left the workshop of the world. And now <clears throat> we've got so many different um, parts of our society who are on strike. We've got, for the first time ever, in history, we've got nurses on strike because there are 40,000 vacancies for nurses and the jobs are not looking attractive because nurses haven't had a with inflation rise for 13 years. So they've estimated that had the nurses simply got with inflation rise, they should have 25% more in their pay packet. <clears throat> but of course, they're being demonized. And the pollsters are doing polls every day, trying to turn the bourgeois press that you talk about, Rude, trying to turn ordinary people against ordinary people. And they're starting to say, you know, your grandmother, you are going to die because these nurses have gone on strike and try and make it interpersonal when it's actually about surplus, surplus value. Because what we're seeing now is billions and billions and billions and billions of profits. You know, academics are on strike again. We've been striking now every year for the last seven years, apart from one. And our salaries are 30% short because we've never had inflation rises for the last 13 years either. And they took away 30% of our pension because they said that they valued the pension unlawfully. And there's billions of pounds surplus in the pension. And workers turned against worker because these precarious workers will say, I'm desperate for a job. I'll work without a pension. I'll work on half the money that they'll work for. And worker is pitched against worker. And so the trains are on strike, the driving instructors are on strike, academics are on strike, nurses. It just goes on. Millions and millions of days are going to be lost this month, they say. But, but I don't think they'll win. What they're trying to do now is what people are saying is neo-feudalism to bring us back to this, this way where we just, we are in this forever precariety and the kind of lifestyles that we've enjoyed since the war, they'll just disappear. They're trying to impoverish the whole of society. And it's a time for everybody to stand up together now. You know, people are not heating their homes in this country because, because the utility bills are so expensive and the utility companies are making hundreds of billions of pounds profit so they're charging this money because there's no competition and they can just charge it. I'd say just everybody should just say, we don't want it, keep it. What are you gonna do with it? And then they'd have to pay as a price that we'd pay if we all stuck together, if we'd agreed to pay. But people won't stick together. So it's, we're in a very, very precarious situation over here. Yeah. Um, and people will die, as Medhi talks about. Because you know, we know as social scientists that if you create these kind of conditions, there will be thousands and thousands of people who prematurely die this winter. You don't need much of a sociological imagination to know that that's going to happen. But people don't care, because they don't care as long as it's not them. But when it is their children or their family, then they start to care, then they want everybody to care, but it's too late. Sometimes uh, events are there which throw for a moment some light on things. We had a railroad strike and the railroad workers wanted to have seven uh, days sick leave. And the liberal uh, government um, repressed the strike, but did not force the ruling group, which uh, appropriates the surplus value, that they would grant the seven days of uh, uh, of sick leave. That means this group, which accumulates the surplus value, also uses the state as a tool in order to uh, pave its way. That's right. And when people are actually speaking, you know, the union leaders are speaking about, you know, why are we talking about what a nurse's salary is? You know, why are we actually even going there? Why are we talking about the chief executive salary who does nothing? And, and talking basically about surplus value theory, these people are just demonized in the press and there is no 
alternative press, what are you going to read? You're going to read a Marxist newspaper. So all of what looks like the choices of the press have all got the same discourse. Mm. And so people don't have any way of thinking outside of that. And the union leaders who start talking about, you know, we just get a fraction. We get the crumbs. We're just fighting over the crumbs of the cake and, and all the rest of it. And they're said to be dinosaurs. <clears throat> the dinosaurs, this is all thinking. We don't live in that world anymore. And we still live in that world, as you're saying, Rude. You know, we still live in that world, but people don't think they live in that world. Yeah. Okay, well, I, you know, we're coming to the end of our allotted <clears throat> time of what Zoom will allow us to do. So, um, yeah, Sayyid Java, do you want to say anything? Are you still with us? I know it's after 9.30 in Tehran to, right now. Sayyid's got to go to bed now. <laughs> yes, I am. Please just walk away. I was actually, I was actually reflecting upon what you were saying, and I was thinking loudly that uh, does it mean whatever you are saying is there going to be a twenty second century for us? Is uh, there? Yes, but nothing like twenty first century, definitely. It's going to be different but it'll maybe be the world will get better who knows you know but any possibility then we that have become we can, so and from where i'm standing and looking at the world it looks like fast towards authoritarianism rather than democratic yeah. tendencies so i really... what's that no you're you're cutting out <laughs> so i hope yeah i hope yeah, yeah. I hope, I hope uh, we can continue these discussions. Uh, Christmas and Happy New Year. Hope to see you all. All right. In 2023. Thank you.